Um, so tonight's program is in the uh, is the second in the series of events that we've organised in conjunction with our current exhibition at Art Space uh, by the filmmaker and writer Hito Style. Uh, in order to expand on the more discursive aspects of Hito's work that encompass her writing and her lectures, uh, documentation of which you can see upstairs, um, but also the long-running dialogues with other artists, writers and thinkers, uh, we've asked uh, Hito to program with us a number of events that will reflect on these engagements. So we're very pleased to welcome tonight uh, artist Anton Vidokler and philosopher Boris Royce for a screening and conversation revolving around Anton's, Anton's work on the earlier 20th century Russian philosophical movement of cosmism. As co-editor of Eflux Journal, Anton has collaborated with Hito on the regular publishing of her writings, but they also share a dialogue through the concerns active within the work as artists. The film This Is Cosmos was completed by Anton last year and draws from the idiosyncratically concrete metaphysics of cosmism, particularly the writings of philosopher Nikolai Fedorov. So after the screening, which is around, uh, has a running time of around 30 minutes, Anton will be joined by Boris for a conversation about the film to elaborate on some of its concerns and the manner in which it takes off traces of utopian philosophy after the end of the Soviet Union and in the present day. So hopefully many of you will have uh, also seen Spectres of Communism, the exhibition curated by Boris at the James Gallery at Euflux earlier this year, which addressed some concerns as evident in the work of, some of these concerns as evident in the work of contemporary Russian artists. Uh, so once again, thank you all for coming and enjoying the film. Thank you. I'd just firstly like to do a, a kind of formal introduction for those of you who aren't familiar with Anton and Boris. Um, Anton Vidokler is an artist and co-editor of Eflux Journal. He's exhibited work internationally at venues including Documenta 13, the Venice Biennial and Tate Modern. As a founder of Eflux, he's organized an image bank for everyday revolutionary life and the Martha Rosler Library. And his other works include Time Bank, co-organized with Julieta Aranda and United Nations Plaza, a 12-month experimental school in Berlin, organized as a response to the Unrealized Manifesto 6. Most recently, Vidokla exhibited films in the Montreal Biennial, uh, a film called 2084, a science fiction show with Pelin Tan, and at the Shanghai Biennial. And Boris Groys is a philosopher, essayist, art critic, media theorist. He has served as the curator of several international ex exhibitions, including the recent Spectres of Communism that I mentioned earlier. And is the author of publications including On the New, published last year, Introduction to Anti-Philosophy, Going Public, Art Power, and the Total Art of Stalin, in addition to numerous articles of art criticism and history. Grace is a distinguished professor at NYU and the Center for Art, Media, and Technology in Karlsruhe, and the European Graduate School at Sassfei in Switzerland. Um, so I think we just wanted to, this is gonna be quite an open conversation, and please do feel free to, to ask questions at any point. But I think the point at which we thought we would start, which was um, really to perhaps ask Anton and Boris to give a bit of an overview of cosmism and to also ask the question, why now? Why, why return to cosmism at this point in time? So maybe, yeah. Anton, you could talk about that in relation to the film and what, what stimulated the film. Uh, sure. I mean, I've only kind of learned about this um, movement in art and philosophy and science quite recently, about three or four years ago, actually, from Boris, uh, who published a book in German in early 90s. Uh, it's an anthology of various essays by writers from this movement, but also quite people that are not normally associated with it, like Trotsky, for example. And unfortunately, the book is in German, and I do not speak German, so I could not actually re read it. But a little bit later, um, uh, during an interview that um, I had to do with Ilya Kabakov, uh, a Russian artist that probably a lot of you know, with whom Boris has been in conversation for more than 40 years now, probably, uh, it, uh, Kabakov actually told me a little bit about it, and then I kind of realized that almost half of his artistic production in a certain way addresses this philosophy, this particular movement. Um, so after that I got very, very curious and started doing some research 
and came across an incredibly wide cultural layer, which is not only comprised of writing, but uh, also of paintings and sculptures and films and uh, all sorts of theatrical productions and uh, uh, scientific works, experiments, devices, you know, and it, it, it uh, was completely amazing to me that something so vast, because it really, at a certain point, you can argue that it includes production of just about everybody within the Soviet avant-garde, uh, its theater tradition, its cinematic tradition, scientific circles, were in certain way implicated in this. And so it was very, very surprising that, uh, you know, I have never come across any information about it. And there is a very simple reason for this is that this movement was repressed since early 1930s. And uh, a lot of this information has never, the books were never published until the 90s. Uh, so uh, relatively few people knew about it. But Boris one, was one of the people who actually had quite a lot of information. So maybe he can say a few words about it. So historically, <clears throat> the movement started uh, at the end of the 19th century. And the most important figure was Nikolai Fedorov. Uh, at that time, uh, Russian uh, philosophy and Russian political uh, consciousness was shocked by the new waves of materialism by Marx and Nietzsche at that time. The influence was combined by the feeling there is no God, there is no uh, salvation, there is no immortality, there is no resurrection, there is only complete dependence on the milieu people are living in, yes, yeah? so social milieu, ecological milieu, global milieu, but also cosmic milieu, because uh, we are living in a planet that is not only global, not only ecologically correct or incorrect, <coughs> but also flying somewhere in the universe and is subjected to uh, all kinds of influence. Uh, we have something like a cosmic anxiety, uh, some, some kind of fear of cosmos. Uh, I think a good example is Lars von Trier movie, uh, Melancholia, yeah, it's, it's a good example of that. And at the same time, uh, a feeling of openness, adventure, a feeling that we can transcend Earth, that we are not, that Earth is not a prison, that we can go, into something basically unknown. Uh, and if you look at uh, uh, Russian, not only Russian, I would say also the Western uh, mentality at the uh, end of the 19th century, between the 20th century, that was a time as people tried to keep a certain religious Christian promise, promise of resurrection, promise of authority. Uh, but realize that by revolutionary social and technological means. If you look not only at the Russian tradition, but also Bauhaus, the style, uh, radical movements in Italy at that time, if you read Ernst Junger and earlier uh, German literature of that time, we have repeatedly this attempt not to capitulate, yeah? Uh, attempt to put this material forces under control and to realize what was promised on a kind of cultural or ideological or religious level uh, by material means. And of course, uh, Russian cosmos is a, is a specific part of that, yeah? Maybe uh, more radical than any, uh, anything else, but also uh, Russian Revolution was more radical than any other revolution in the 20th century. That was simply time in Russia. Everything was radical. Everything was revolutionary. <coughs> and so this movement also radicalized the ideas that were uh, everywhere, but not in such, kind of, such a focused form. And maybe, maybe you could talk a little bit about this idea of... Um of the extension of life through through any means possible and how that kind of played out across different disciplines and in, in forms of engagement from, as you talked about, Anton, from, uh, from, from writing to theatre to filmmaking and so on. Well, uh, sure. Um, you know, basically, 
at least in the writings of Fedorov, of his, his, it's a kind of a one, one idea philosophy. Yeah? Basically, it, uh, it just uh, implies the urgent necessity to achieve immortality by any means possible through the usage of art, sciences, technology, social organization. And uh, yeah, everything is basically subordinated to that task. Uh, in a way, it's a very, very, very simple thing because really you can summarize it, summarize it in one sentence. But of course, the kind of restructuring of society, the kind of restructuring of ideology, of culture, of every aspect of human life, including our relationship to nature, our relationship to urbanization, uh, it, it basically implies kind of radical transformation of yeah, how we live together, how we live on this planet, how we live, period. And uh, basically, it was a kind of a truly activist philosophy. Yeah, in that sense, maybe it's not precisely a philosophy in the Western sense because it's not really so much about contemplation rather than urgent action in whatever field that you are actually uh, occupied in. And if you're a painter, then you, you have to basically try to extend human life, try to extend, improve human health, try to, yeah, sort of achieve some kind of elongation, prolongation of human lifespan through your work, or you can do it as a scientist, or you can do it as a poet, or a theater director, or a, a yeah, political leader. So, uh, in a way, like, for me, it's, as, as an artist, it's, this is very, very interesting, because, for example, Maria Lind uh, has just done a couple of evenings at Eflux of conversations around the topic of what does art do? Yeah, so in a way, Fedorov has a very radical idea of what art can do, and for him, art can make us immortal, art can extend life, art can cure ailments, art can resurrect the dead, art can um, spiritualize the entire universe and make inorganic matter thinking matter, you know? So uh, the way he thinks of art is really kind of very expansive. Um, but maybe Boris would like to say a few words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure, I will do. You know, I think the problem is, uh, can we formulate very, very simple way? Uh, again, secularization, materialization, materialism. So, his first wave was connected to the idea there is no immortal soul, we die, nothing survives. Yeah, so we will look at the uh, literature of the 19th century, so everything is about that. But at the end of the 19th century, people began to realize that it's not the case. Because if the soul dies, co the corpse survives. Yeah? So simultaneous death is actually not possible. Either corpse, uh, yeah, the body is dead and soul survives, or soul is dead by corpse survives. So corpse is there. It remains, and the question is what to do with it. Yeah? Uh, we, we, we should not, uh, we should not uh, forget the fact that uh, Dracula uh, by Bram Stoker was written absolutely at the same time as Fyodor wrote mm -hmm. uh, his text. So at the end of the 19th century, for the first time, uh, people began to see a perspective of immortal light not given by gods through the immortal soul, but given by certain kind of techno technology. That could be a mystical technology, a magic technology, or that could be a real industrial technology uh, to bring the corpse back to life. And that is actually the whole idea uh, of Fyodorov as a real project. And why art? Because art has to do, according to Fyodorov, with keeping things, restoring them, and caring about them, yeah? So if we, he argues that we go into the industry or war and economy, people, uh, things are replaced, and people are also replaced, yeah? So if something uh, becomes obsolete, it is replaced uh, by a new model. But in the museum and in the art history in general, all things are restored and kept. And so we have basically two modes of technical dealing with objects and also things and also bodies uh, to keep them or to 
substitute them, yeah? And so if art is about keeping them, then art is good for people. Actually, the idea in itself uh, comes from Nietzsche because Nietzsche says at one place, it is much better to be an artwork than to be an artist, yeah? <laughs> it is better to cre yeah, it is better to be an object of admiration and care, yeah? As to admire and care something different. And so I think that uh, what's interesting about time and what, what, what uh, fascinates me in this whole movement is the fact that human beings for the first time became to, uh, to be enchanted, fascinated by the idea not to be subject but to be objects. Yeah? And if you, if you read, um, if you read uh, Fedorov, he imagines the uh, society of the future, the state of the future, as a huge museum of population, where the government is actually a curator, loving a caring uh, man as museum items. Yeah? This kind of man as, as an art object, yeah, as an art, art object deserving care and restoration, yeah, and prolongation of his or her life, that is, I think, the sea change. Yeah, it's a really what they try to do, the truth, try to think human being as object and not as a subject. I mean, that's, that's kind of really interesting in relation to, or, or just thinking about the idea of care for the human body, but the human body as a corpse. And, I mean, perhaps you could talk a little bit more about how, how uh, this idea intersected with space travel and the technological drive towards space travel and as a means of prolonging human life or resurrecting human life. You know, as I uh, once, uh, indeed in Germany, after I published this book, I had a very interesting discussion with a guy uh, who is uh, Asman, yeah, who is a leading uh, German Egyptologist. And he told me, that uh, in old Egypt, ancient Egypt, there was two periods of human existence. One is a childhood, uh, more or less until 14, 15 years yeah, old. And in, in this period of childhood, uh, one was expected to experience his body as a as really living body. Yeah? And then he was informed that he actually lives in a corpse, in a future mummy. And he was trained already from 15, 14, 15 years to see his own body as, as a corpse. Yeah? And think about what can be done after his death with his body and uh, what kind of shape given and how it can be placed and so on and so on. So we'll, uh, in, in a certain way, Russian cosmos is a return to that. And indeed, cosmic flight has to do with two things. First of all, uh, to bring all this resurrected body to the other planets, because there is no enough time for that, uh, enough space for that in, on, a, on the planet Earth. And actually, that was the beginning, official beginning of the Soviet space program. Yatsyalkovsky uh, was a part of the movement of so-called cosmist, um, immortalist biocosmists, yeah? and he planned the first rocket to bring the resuscitated day to other planets. But on the other hand, this uh, existence as a corpse was seen as a good possibility for cosmic travel. Uh, he describes that also, so you can, you, you, you're like a mummified inside the spaceship, then for a very long time, yeah, you're brought down as a, and, and then you are resuscitated for the second time, yeah, so to say. It's making me think of interstellar at the moment, somehow. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I, maybe, um, Anton, you could talk about the film itself in terms of structurally how uh, you approach making this, obviously it doesn't, it's not a history of cosmism in any way, but it's, it's taking on cosmism as a, I guess, as a, as seeing through that idea that this, that the ideas of cosmism can be 
work through different disciplines. And I mean, the, the aspect of the red screen and the notion of a radiation therapy comes into play as a, as a, functioning, uh, as a functioning entity in terms of the audience uh, in relation to this idea of prolonging life and healing the corpse. I had a coffee with a friend of mine this morning and uh, who told me that he really hates this kind of situations where filmmakers, where there is a screening and then the, the, the filmmaker talks about the film because it's always kind of disappointing. Or it, uh, <laughs> if you like the film, it only undermines the kind of the ambient effect of it. Or if you didn't like the film, it seems that then they just talk about all of their intentionality, which is not really matched by what you just saw. So it's a <clears throat> no-win situation. So, Maybe I should take his advice and not specifically talk about the film, but we, it's, it's very interesting to speak about cosmism and all of these people in that period. And so, yeah, to, to, so indirectly, maybe to answer your question, it was one of the things that was particularly appealing to me when I started reading about all of these people, when I started looking at their work, is how incredibly interdisciplinary they were so early on, but not as a kind of a lip service to interdisciplinarity, but uh, there was something very uncanny that almost every single one of the key protagonists of this movement was a scientist, a poet, uh, a painter sometimes, uh, also perhaps wrote music, uh, translated, uh, I don't know, ancient Egyptian poetry, uh, but, and, it's, but the most interesting thing, maybe not on the level of a talented hobbyist, yeah, but uh, they did not see a kind of a hierarchical um, division between their activities. Yeah, it was not more important to conduct a scientific experiment than to write a, a, a poem or make a painting. Yeah, all of these different ways of working were, were perceived as equally important and valuable, which is really something I've never quite come across in another, you know, kind of movement or another group. Yeah, normally there is quite a bit of hierarchy. Um, and, and of course, it maybe goes back a little bit to Fedorov indirectly, although, again, it's, this is not uh, by any means an organized movement. You cannot call it a school. A lot of these people met in a very, very accidental way. Fedorov never formally taught. He was never a professor. He was basically a librarian most of his life. And, a lot of these people that encountered him, like Tsiolkovsky, it was almost accidental how the meeting took place. It's also, he, Fedorov was never published during his lifetime, except for very few things that appeared in really newspapers. Uh, so th there was not like a kind of a, a whole kind of structure how one would receive his ideas, yeah. It was not a kind of a disciplined, uh, formalized movement. Um, Yes, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> um, maybe the question that, that I have is how, how cosmism kind of intersected with communism in that. Maybe Boris, you mm. could talk about that. I think in the way in which Trotsky said avant-garde uh, intersects with communism, he said about avant-garde that avant-garde was very lucky, you know, because every avant-garde movement disappeared like after five or six years. But suddenly, Russian avant-garde got a chance that all other avant-garde movements never had. The same uh, happens to, uh, happened to cosmism. After the revolution, a group of people organized a party. This part, that was a political party, uh, immortalized by a cosmist. And uh, they proposed to amend. They were also elected in some parliaments, in Petrograd and also in Moscow. And they proposed to amend uh, the Soviet Constitution by introducing three rights into it. Yeah, it's human rights, it's basic human rights. It's a right of immortality, a right of total rejuvenation, physical rejuvenation every year, and free individual flight in the cosmic space. And they took that very seriously. So some uh, money was allocated uh, to all these projects, including rejuvenation, uh, Institute for Rejuvenation through uh, transfer, blood transfusion were organized by uh, Bogdanov, who was co-founder, actually, of Bolshevist party and uh, close associate Lenin, the first uh, 
uh, stages of the movement, uh, he really uh, wanted to create a common body, a system, a kind of network of blood transfusion that connects all the human on Earth so that all human on Earth would have actually same blood but changing every year. And his idea was that this rejuvenation really takes place uh, if you exchange uh, your uh, blood, it's a very Dracula-like idea, of course, with the blood uh, of young people. And so he actually exchanged his blood with the blood of his students. But it's interesting that uh, saying that he, f he feels himself better and the students getting wiser. Uh, but at a certain point in time, uh, he had a student, uh, she was dying actually. She had a very seldom, very rare... I think it was uh, malaria. Yeah, it was rare blood infection. And she basically committed suicide. Uh, he exchanged his blood with the blood of the student, student survived and uh, he died. Yeah. So that, but that, before that he was died, a, I've read from uh, people yeah. uh, close to him that they didn't notice that he started looking better and he, he was balding uh, and then suddenly his hair started growing back. So his uh, treatment of blood transfusion apparently was working until basically it didn't work. Yeah. Uh, but he didn't work, uh, not, uh, not out of mistake or whatever, but it was his constant decision to save the life of the student. So uh, we have this uh, life stories, and the sum of these life stories uh, gives us a certain lesson. Yeah? I don't know what this lesson is. Yeah? <laughs> You know, uh, it, is a, it is a lesson that reminds me of kind of Dan or Chan Buddhistic lessons. Yeah, it is a lesson, but it is a lesson. We know that it is a lesson, but we know what kind of lesson it is. <laughs> and I think it is precisely what, what fascinates us. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe to come back to this question of, of why now a little bit, because... Um, I mean, we were talking earlier about how uh, we, ha we are very rooted in ideas of globalization and ecology and so on now, and this kind of notion of cosmism, this uh, idea of, of uh, a world beyond, in a way, a, a kind of uh, this sense of a, of a global community or whatever, is, um, seems very like it's a shift for what we're used to kind of conceiving of now. So I wonder why... Um, why return to cosmism now? And also maybe to talk a little bit about that idea of immortality as uh, something that doesn't seem, you know, it's within culture in a certain regard, you know, in vampiricism and zombieism, if you like. But then, uh, you know, do we have the same, that same aspiration towards scientific prolonging of life or immortality in, this, in, in a similar sense to cosmism? I think there are very different concepts of what happens to the corpse. Uh, for example, Tsiolkovsky, who was a, uh, who was a follower of uh, Fedorov, as I said, he wanted to send um, living corpses to the other planets. At the same time, he suddenly interrupted uh, his writing, and he wrote a small text, and he say, uh, said, I'm interrupting this writing to say something very important before I die. And he says the following thing. He says that your corpse after your death will be happy because it dissolves and all the molecules and atoms that existed inside your corpse in a kind of um, subdued uh, position and, and a kind of prisoners yeah, of your corpse begin to travel yeah, because the corpse begin to dissolve. And that will be a very happy travel, yeah. Every atom and every molecule of your organism will be happy and enjoy this travel. I was reminded uh, of, this, uh, of this 
passage, you know, the, there is a German uh, artist who makes uh, sculpture out of corpses. Von Hagen. You can see from time to time also exhibitions here in New York. And accidentally, I was teaching in a school uh, not very far from this Hagen uh, factory where all the sculptures were produced. And so I went there to ask yeah, how it happened. And I was uh, shown um, a very interesting uh, video. So a couple, elderly German couple, so around 70, yeah. Uh, came and said they want to give the corpses. And von Hagen said, there are two ways to give the corpus. For science, then the corpse uh, will be sliced. Or in unsliced form, we use it for art. Then the husband said, uh, said I want to be sliced. <laughs> and it was not put in question. But the woman said, um, no, I don't want to be sliced. I want to, to be whole and that you make a beautiful sculpture out of me. And then he asks, he asks why, uh, why, and that is somehow answer to your question. She said, you know, I spent uh, all the time in a small German town and we didn't have enough money to be able to travel. And I know that you are a very famous artist and your sculpture are traveling all around the world on the very different exhibitions. And so I want that my body and my corpse after my death will travel to all these beautiful places, yeah, like Venice and so on. I couldn't, <laughs> Venice by the way. So, I couldn't visit uh, during my lifetime. And this idea of uh, post, uh, post-mortal circulation yeah, of the body as an artwork as a substitute to paradise, yeah, uh, really impressed me, especially because it was uh, formulated in a very straightforward way by a woman who really believed in it. She believed in Venice by, you know, more than the Catholic Church, yeah, obviously, yeah. And a chance to be, uh, yeah, the chance to be shown in the artwork more than the happiness of the immortal soul. I might at this point ask if there's any questions from the audience. There's one there. Nico, do you want to? Oh, I'm just curious as to how this plays out in relation to Tomajevich, suprematism, the fourth dimension, because they're happening at the same time, and there's got to be a relationship. Well, Malevich, uh, if you have this kind of uh, ambiguity of Apollonian and Dionysian, yeah, in a certain way, cosmos and chaos. Then Malevich was, at the beginning at least of his career, uh, artistic career at the side of the chaos. Uh, Victory over the sun, uh, the operas and, and black squares, a part of it, celebrate um, the destruction of cosmos and cosmic order coming of total chaos, yeah, death of the sun, yeah, dissolution of all of the social order and individual bodies. But then he changed his attitude and late twenties, beginning of the surface, he starts uh, at the beginning parallel together with Lisitsky and then alone uh, to, to project so called planeta planets, planets, uh, that, is, that are um, anti-gravitational uh, cities that can fly freely in the cosmic space. Yeah. Uh, in a strange way, if you look at the, um, this movie, uh, Star Wars, yeah, uh, this, this, <laughs> this terrible cosmic Think yeah with, with death, uh, so, death on, yeah death on, uh, lo- looks very much like planets yeah they were like that yeah like that. 
Can you come over there? Thank you. Uh, so as you mentioned, uh, there was some productive interaction of uh, Cosmism with uh, scientific research, namely uh, the space program, in the way you phrased it. Uh, was there a revisiting of these ideas post-cybernetic uh, uh, era in Russia, or with that type of scientific research? Maybe you'll tell about this uh, friend, NASA friend. Uh, which one? Oh, 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 yeah. oh, the NASA friend? Oh, the, this avia engineer. Uh, yes, we, we just actually, it's interesting, the, the kind of the main translator of Fedorov in in, to English is an American engineer from, I believe, North Carolina. We just had him uh, come and uh, speak about Fedorov at Eflux a couple of weeks ago, but it's very interesting. He works, he's a, um, he is a, a, a avio engineer. He works for a federal, uh, 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 what do you call it, F, uh, FAA, which is the Federal Aviation uh, commission. So it seems to be that within NASA and within certain kind of engineering circles in the United States, but in many other countries, there was quite a significant awareness of these ideas, largely because, I mean, you know, a lot of NASA's, you know, program is based on, let's say, Tsiolkovsky's mathematical equations, and it's probably impossible to you know, use the equations without having some awareness of all of his other writings, of all of his kind of very, very rich output in terms of science fiction and all sorts of things that he wrote. Uh, but more specifically in terms of like kind of uh, internet and, and, and cybernetic thing, yes, there is a direct link, of course, because a lot of the, you know, people in, 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 in California labs, but also mm -hmm. at MIT were very directly inspired, specifically by the writings of Bogdanov. Bogdanov is one of the people that Boris was talking about with the Institute of Immortality, but in fact his main work uh, was a, a kind of a new science that he invented in 1920s, which is called technology. It's basically uh, a, a science of systems, yeah, uh, kind of a science of sciences, and uh, it was published in Russian and in German in 1926. And rumors are that th this is basically the origin of cybernetics, that Norbert Wiener was extremely familiar with this particular book and then developed cybernetics based on Bogdanov's ideas. And of course, when cybernetics comes to the United States after World War II, it becomes very, very influential within the entire kind of early computer community, which if you watch Adam Curtis films, you see how that plays out. Yeah, so somehow all of these ideas are very, even though they were, let's say, suppressed in the Soviet Union, but they kind of continued in another part of the world. And then, ironically, cybernetics was not a very popular science, or, you know, the original books of Norbert Wiener were not very well received in the United States outside of a very, very elite scientific community. In fact, it was rejected by the larger scientific establishment. But strangely enough, when they were translated to Russian, they were a gigantic hit in the Soviet Union in the 60s. So cosmism come back via Norbert Wiener back to where it started. Yeah. So all of this kind of movements of ideas and 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 yeah, thoughts are kind of there. It's very intricate how it works. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Just, just quickly, do you have? A, I mean, do you have a, anything like a, a, a bibliography that you put together when you were making this film of, of places to start in terms of reading uh, some of these writers? Because I know that a lot of them have not been translated, and it, it is actually just you know, it really is becoming more from science than. If, if you could comment on that, or if you have anybody... You yeah, of course. There is a very popular book that came out about two years ago by uh, George C. Young, who is an American uh, academic uh, who's been kind of studying and writing about this for the past 30 years, I believe, which is called Russian Cosmism. Uh, this is a good place to start. And also the writings of Fedorov, I think the first volume has been translated and published. It's out of print, it's called, but it's called The Common Task, which is basically his philosophy for mortality and that now exists in English. Uh, you know, some of the scientific writing, some of Tsiolkovsky is translated. Uh, I don't think very much Bogdanov is translated except for his political writings because he's more famous as, as a political thinker. Uh, in terms of other scientists, I believe Vladimir Vernatsky, some of his writing 
is translated. He is the kind of the originator of this idea of noosphere, of the kind of a telepathic sphere of reason surrounding our planet, which maybe even more directly relates to certain kind of issues of communication and, you know, uh, uh, computers and internet and stuff like that. So th there is some material available, but I think the, uh, for me what is more interesting is not to look at this kind of singular examples, but to look much broader at the Russian and Soviet avant-garde, because as I was saying in the beginning, these ideas and this thinking motivates and inspires so much of cultural production, it becomes almost incomprehensible without this information. And in fact, you know, for example, there was an exhibition, a rather nice exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art, which I believe it was called something like The Origin of Abstraction. A couple of years ago, it was beautifully hung and they really collect, gathered really quite amazing works. But when you look at the show, you see it through this canonical sort of reading of modernism, of avant-garde, as a kind of a formal phenomena, yeah? Where if you really look at the intellectual sphere around Malevich, around, but even not only the Russian ones, yeah? If, uh, Sonia Delano, Robert mm -hmm. Delano, uh, all of the other counterparts, yeah? It's much richer than formalism, yeah? There is a lot of quite strange and fascinating ideas that, you know, that they're reacting to, which have to do with science, which have to do with occult, which have to do with uh, things that are not necessarily, you know, kind of development of uh, formalist strategies. You know. Yeah, um, thank you. Hello, I'm here in the back. Um, actually, I just would like to know, I found it quite interesting when you were talking about earlier um, this idea of the um, objectification of the subject, basically this inversion of agency. I think both was you talking about it. Um, so I am actually just interested in the sites where this took actually place then, you know, that basically um, something inanimate would become an animate thing and could actually in return animate something, you know, that would then in, in this moment of animation be objectified. I would just be interested how this actually, you know, where this was actually thought through in reality, like which were the sites where this took place? Well, I think that uh, the concept that human being is an object, and this object should be sh shaped or reshaped, yeah, so that the new man uh, could be uh, could emerge out of the old man and new mankind out of the old mankind. That, that was the almost general belief uh, of the beginning of the 20th century in radical avant-garde. Uh, if, you, if you assume that the human being is a body, is a thing among other things, and that's what you have to assume if you want to be a realist, if you want to be a materialist in a scientific sense of 19th century and 20th century, then in a very strange way indeed, art uh, becomes politics. Art becomes a, an approach that has a goal to shape individual humans, shape human relationships, shape the state, yeah, the form of the state, shape the cities, and so on and so on. And then you have this very interesting project. Uh, there's not enough time to, to mention all of them. But for example, shaping of the sleep. Yeah? Huge projects, artistic projects, architectural projects, that they also take place in, uh, in the 20s, beginning of the 20s. How we design the sleep, yeah, actually. How we design uh, the food, how we design this, how we design that. This concept of the total design of shaping of the world is, of course, basic, um, basic avant-garde project. And I totally agree with Anton. If you take some kind of fragments of these projects out of the whole, you can't understand it. It's like you, you, you look at, uh, I don't know, Egyptian mummy uh, in a museum, and you don't understand the Egyptian culture and, 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 and the sense of it, yeah? Uh, when, uh, when I see, if I see the, 
uh, this uh, individual objects put in a museum comparison and so on and so on. I just don't understand the function, yeah. And uh, actually, uh, avant-garde was everything about function, about what you do with it. All this means, all these tools were used for a goal. Um, we've been talking about the kind of the object side of um, cosmism, but um, maybe this is for you, Anton, first. I'm sure you can add something to it. But what about the places and the the aspect that you were looking at in the film, the energy of cosmism? Because I know for you it was important to kind of discover some of the places that have more cosmos or have more importance or emphasis um, in relation to cosmism and the the kind of the opposite side, the 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 ephemeral aspect of it, where you can kind of feel that there is something. Well, that was just an excuse to get money from you <laughs> for, for, for a fantastic trip. No, Kate has been kind of a very, very important supporter of this project. She is the uh, chief curator of Garage Museum in Moscow, who actually funded uh, production of this film and all of the travel, because it's actually, it was quite difficult. It's The, the geographical territory is enormous, and... Um, uh, yeah, I wouldn't have been able to do it otherwise. But uh, basically, uh, we try to we, we try to. Okay, now I'm contradicting what I said earlier about not talking about the film. <laughs> but we basically followed certain uh, locations that were important, let's say, for Fedorov, yeah, uh, and for some of the other figures in this movement, not knowing what we will find there. Fedorov writes a lot about this region in southern Siberia called Altai which is a very, very beautiful place. It's a kind of a mountainous region. It's, let's say, the beginning of the Himalayan plateau, that, and then it just goes up and up and up from there. But it's, it was quite important that in the late 19th century because, well, because of mummies. Uh, they, basically, it was inhabited by a very, very ancient civilization, which apparently is the, the kind of, let's say, the, the, the ancestor of almost all European civilizations that come later uh, that was quite unusual because it was actually uh, when they kind of uh, opened up certain burial grounds they discovered that uh, it was completely mixed between uh, between Asian race and the European race so you would have let's say a burial of a king and his uh, he, the king would be uh, would have like uh, Asian features, and the queen would have Slavic features. So it was a very kind of cosmopolitan empire. Also, it was one of the most important archaeological discoveries at the time. It was it was also, I think, one of the first times mummies were found outside of Egypt. They had a completely different way of mummification. But I think Fedorov was very, very much excited by this. And also, in the 19th century, a lot of people thought that uh, the Garden of Paradise was located somewhere around there, basically, in the Himalayas, because it's, there are some descriptions of it that uh, uh, in, in the Bible and other sources that it's, the garden is located at the, inter, it, at the place where four rivers intersect. And apparently, there is such a place uh, in where now there is mo modern Kyrgyzstan. So basically, we really wanted to go there to see if we could f you know, find this location, maybe even look for the body of Adam. This is very, very important for Fedorov because he feels that the project of resurrection should start with the, with the resurrection of the first human being. Yeah? So you really s need to find Adam bring him to Moscow, to the Kremlin, and then like start resurrecting <laughs> from there on. So we kind of wanted to see, like, maybe we can actually do that. But we couldn't get a visa to go to Kyrgyzstan. So we were fortunate to get a visa to go to Kazakhstan, which is next door. And, uh, so, <laughs> uh, yes. and then something else happened, yeah. But. Yeah, maybe I once... Um, I once read an uh, interesting story, uh, I don't know if it's true or not, uh, a story about two Papua tribes in New Guinea. They always lived and shared the same territory, and for a very long time, so centuries and centuries, centuries, completely peaceful. And then suddenly, they began to make war, and they did this war one year, and after this year, um, and since then, 
uh, they live peacefully again. What I was trying to end is that the year was 1968. And, uh, you know, so it's not maybe so much about places, but times. Yeah, there are certain, there are certain years uh, that where maybe sun, maybe cosmos, produce too much energy, and send too much energy to the human beings, and then begin to be let's say, avant-garde, yeah, that happens at the beginning of the 20th century, that happens in 68, that didn't happen since then, yeah. And we actually don't know if it will happen again, but I firmly believe that all these uh, upheavals uh, actually happens under the influence of certain cosmic energies. And so, in these terms, we can differentiate at least among years, if not places. There's a question back here. Um, Boris, you talked about uh, the cosmos philosophy in relation to the Egyptian philosophy and the body as a vessel. But I think you guys said that in cosmos philosophy, there's no immortal soul. So, how does the body as a vessel play into the cosmos philosophy and is the resurrection of uh, past human beings like Adam, does their soul come or is it a new consciousness in the same body? How is, is the body viewed just as a vessel or does it have its own consciousness or is it just grounds for a new consciousness? You or me? I think all these questions uh, have no answer. Uh, I can, I can follow on this line and ask the classical questions like, do you want really to resurrect Hitler and let him do the same things he did before <coughs> and so on and so on? The answer is, of course, yes, maybe, but to explain him, he should be better, something like that. So. <laughs> I think that uh, once a student of, uh, or a follower of Fyodorov asked this question, uh, what actually, uh, when this uh, project will be realized? And Fyodorov said, it is already done after I wrote it. And I think it's a completely correct answer it's about change of the mind uh, of the audience. It's a change of the mind of the mankind. It's about what the mankind here and now thinks about, yeah? What are the goals of the progress? And the problem of uh, uh, Fyodorov was, of course, that he hated progress. In this uh, respect, he was like, like Benjamin, yeah? Very much, yeah, his description of progress uh, sound very much like Walter Benjamin's. He hated progress because progress uh, goes forward on the expense of every individual generation. Fyodor says every generation explod, exploits the previous generation and destroys it as the next generation, uh, destroys and exploits um, a living generation, and so on and so on. So let us reverse that. Let us uh, give uh, to the mankind a new goal. Uh, let us uh, put the resurrection of the previous generation as compensation for this suffering exploitation. Yeah? What uh, Walter Benjamin calls weak messianism. Actually, it is a theory of weak, maybe strong theory of the weak messianism. Yeah? It is an attempt to compensate the suffering of the previous generation as a worthy goal to follow. Not necessarily as something that should bring results in the near future. Any last questions? Okay, this one. 
very direct question about the medical aspect of uh, the movie, since we were all exposed to the radiation of red color. So I wonder how um, dangerous it is, and um, if it, or it's just uh, the, that the movie is following the mode of the avant-garde uh, as such, yeah, that avant-garde is about action. Uh, but is there any scientific background? And if it is, what is the role of the error and the interruption? Because it seems to me that the error and this kind of stubbornness of the sound, yeah, and um, interrupt, interruption of the narrative um, creates kind of a sidewalk and a, an important parallel narrative. Thank you. Well, the color red is not dangerous. Uh, yeah. Don't worry, everything is going to be okay. <laughs> no, uh, actually, it, it comes from uh, research done by NASA. I think it was something that they discovered in the early 90s. They had a, a very specific problem because when, when, when cosmonauts or astronauts are in zero gravity for a really long time, uh, the skin doesn't heal, or certain kind of healing processes which occur quite normally on Earth, in, a, in space station take forever. So if you have a paper cut, you can continue bleeding for a very long time. Your skin doesn't heal for weeks. So they were basically trying to find some methodology to expedite healing in zero gravity conditions and it somehow uh, stumbled on the effects of red LED light in a very particular frequency range. Uh, now, in the film, you know, when I made it, it was in, the intention is that at a certain point it will be shown on an LED screen which will be calibrated to a very particular uh, wavelength of color red. Yeah? When it's projected like this, I don't think that it has particularly <laughs> strong healing effects. Yeah? Uh, maybe just a psychological one. Yeah? Uh, but, but in theory, in, in the future, as LED, you know, the, it's, it, I haven't been able to do it because LED screens of this scale are prohibitively expensive, but as we all know, technology becomes more and more accessible and cheaper and cheaper, so I wouldn't be surprised if in five to ten years it would be quite normal to have a large LED screen in an art space, and then you, you would be able to calibrate it and, and, and actually have a kind of a prophylactic session while watching this film. So it's all in the film, we're just waiting for the right technology. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I actually have a related last question maybe, but just... Um, that brings to mind the idea of the monochrome, and maybe, Boris, you could talk a little bit about cosmism in relation to the, to the monochrome, to Rodchenko's, or the idea of the monochrome as the end of art, but also this uni universal, if you like. How does that maybe fit in with cosmism? Well, first of all, red is a color of revolution, it's a red flag, of course. Yeah. So maybe if a red flag will be on this LED uh, technology, <laughs> the technology, it would be helpful yeah, from the beginning. I don't know. But uh, yes, uh, the idea of, of this monochrome for, for the avant-garde painters were very obvious. They wanted to dissolve all the existence, uh, existing um, mixtures of color and all existing mixture of uh, lines and forms and isolate basic elements to reconstruct out of these basic elements a new reality. So it was analytical, always a kind of two-step movement, analytical movement that actually led to this um, so-called last painting, uh, and, and then constructivist. That led to construction of the new world out of these elements. It described uh, very eloquently in the book uh, about monochrome and machine, yeah, of Trabukin. Yeah. So at the moment, a uh, painting reaches monochrome, uh, next step, is a machine, so construction out of this monochrome elements. Okay, maybe I think that's time to call it today, but thank you so much to Boris and Anton.